patch burn grazing, the whole concept began um, in light of how grasslands developed in North America. Derek Scasta is a graduate research associate in natural resource ecology and management at Oklahoma State University. Fires were a naturally occurring process. They occurred variably in space and time, and bison would go to the recently burned areas. And so the plant community essentially is adapted to fire and grazing. And so what we're doing here, we're trying to restore that fire and grazing process. The goal here is to burn the entire pasture every three years. But we do that by burning different patches every year. So we rotate fire around. One key characteristic of this type of management is there's no internal cross fences. There's only one external fence and cattle can select where they want to graze. And what we found is, is they prefer to graze in the recently burned area, like I'm standing here today. Derek's research shows patch burn grazing not only benefits the plant community, but can also have a dramatic impact on a major pest for cattle, horn flies. So last year we looked at horn flies during their peak levels of activity, which are typically the warmer periods of the year. And we compared that to areas that had no fire. And we found that we had a 41% reduction of horn flies in this patch burning um, style of management compared to where they weren't burning. Horn flies are considered the number one external parasite for the beef cattle market in the U.S. Usually there's an impact, economic impact, around $1 billion to $900 million annually that horn flies cause to the beef cattle market both in production losses and considering the c control cost involved in trying to keep a horn fly population down. When you consider some of these impacts, one main one is the weight gain impact. So when you get above 200 horn flies per animal, we get an economic impact of those animals losing one and a half pounds on a weekly basis when compared to those that are being protected by horn flies. Justin Talley is an extension livestock entomologist with Oklahoma State University. He says insecticide impregnated ear tags and insect growth regulators are the most common way of dealing with this pest. But those are expensive and insects are developing resistance. What impacts that resistance is that horn flies go through 25 to 32 different generations in a year. So that's 32 different horn fly populations that are developing on that animal within one summer and they're feeding 20 to 30 times a day. So they're taking a blood meal 20 to 30 times a day. This makes Derek's research all the more valuable. When we started looking at the data, it was amazing when we saw the reduction in horn fly counts just on a patch burn basis. So there's no chemical inputs on these animals. The only thing that was different from the animals was the, the burning uh, program, where it was patch burn per, or versus no burning at all. And when you reduce that by 40%, that's getting it below that 200 horn flies per animal and all year long consistently. So it's, it's highly significant, number one, because it gives you another option when you incur insecticide resistance. And when, you, when that occurs, you need other tools other than insecticides to reduce your horn fly population. Okay, and you and your team study horn flies all the time and make that research and information available to producers on your website? Yes, we do. We uh, do a horn fly demonstration trial every year. So we compare different ear tag products every year. We try to move it around the state a little bit to give, give exposure to different horn fly populations. This year it was in Stillwater. But uh, we have all these product demonstrations online at livestockbugs.okstate.edu and it goes back to 2009. It has, has other horn fly control measures as well on that website. Okay, big issue and, and some good advice today. Justin Talley, our Extension Livestock Entomologist, thanks a lot. And for a link to that website, just go to sunup.okstate.edu.